Our next presenter is Penny Sear, president of the Idaho Education Association. Ms. Sear, we're glad to have you here. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. I'm happy to be here. Um, I am Penny Sear. I'm the president of the Idaho Education Association, elected from the classroom. I taught in Moscow, Idaho for 28 years and have served for the past five and a half years as the elected president. I'm actually looking forward to retirement at the end of July. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm really proud to be here. The IEA is proud to be Idaho's largest professional employee organization who represents and works together with educators to advocate for students, public education, and our profession. We represent thousands of teachers and classified employees, administrators as well, the backbone of our public education system who are in virtually every school building, public school building in Idaho. These experts on education are involved in their communities, inside and out of their schools, and their expertise is needed whenever any education policy or the education of our children is discussed. The IEA staff and I am honored to serve them and represent their voices while they do the most important job in Idaho, educate our children. With me today are several key members of the IEA staff who are amazing resources and hope to collaborate with all of you on education policy during this session. Please reach out to us at any time. Uh, first of all, I have IEA Director of Public Policy, Matt Compton. Welcome. I have IEA Interim Executive Director, Sue Wigdorski. Welcome. IEA General Counsel, Paul Stark. Welcome. And IEA Communications Director, Dave Harbison. I would also like to, if you will indulge me, Chairman, to introduce my teaching colleagues, educators from all over Idaho who serve on the IEA Government Relations Committee and help craft our legislative agenda, which is voted on by our members. So if they'd quickly stand, Amy Biggs from Coeur d'Alene, Joel Williams from Fruitland, Russell G. Luston, Peggy Hoy, Twin Falls, Bob Solomon, Caldwell. Allie Bigham, Boise. Shauna Wheelwright, Snake River. Lane McAnally, our Vice President, was unable to come. He had a doctor appointment. Lori Steinecker, NEA Director from Payette. I didn't miss anybody, I don't think. We have a couple members of our committee who were unable to be here. Um, but I'm, they took uh, today, which is a day that children aren't in school, to come down here to the legislature. And we uh, were in the House Ed this morning and this afternoon. We did business in the middle of the day. So uh, it's, I'm happy that they're here. Thank you. We are too. Yes. We're encouraged by the progress that has been made in public education over the last couple of years and look forward to working with you to take the next steps in ensuring that every child in Idaho has access to great teachers, great education, and has an opportunity to succeed. We believe in and encourage you to follow the commitment to the career ladder salary allocation plan, which was put into place to help us attract and retain high quality teachers. While we are still at a competitive disadvantage compared to our neighboring states, investing in year three of the career ladder will be a very positive step forward. We look forward to working with the education committees and stakeholder groups to make sure the teacher evaluation system is fair, efficient, and manageable. I remind you that the negativity surrounding the evaluation process is not reflective of teacher quality. We have great teachers here in Idaho who would love to come and talk to you all about their students and the work that they do. We are painfully aware of the negative impact that the recession had on public education in Idaho, and we're very glad to see that we have an economic recovery um, going on. However, the discretionary funding for local districts remained stagnant at the 2009 levels when accounting for inflation. 
We appreciate Superintendent Ybarra's budget proposal, which calls for a 4.2% increase in discretionary funds, keeping control and flexibility where it belongs with our local districts. The IEA believes that prosperity we are experiencing should be reflected in discretionary funding um, provided to our districts, which have had to rely on local levies and other inconsistent revenues sources um, far too often. Our economy, as our economy recovers, IEA members believe that the focus must remain on investing in public education systems so that teachers, administrators, and students have the resources they need. IEA members do not support any efforts that siphon off taxpayer dollar, uh, dollars for private schools or tr private charter schools that lack transparency and accountability. Public money should remain invested in public schools. You might be surprised also to hear that the IEA has provided over 8,000 hours of professional development training to uh, over 750 teachers just in this last calendar year. We take our responsibility as stewards of our profession very seriously. These are member-led trainings on topics topics such as student learning objectives, the master teacher premium, technology in the classroom, and anti-bullying strategies, just to name a few. Supporting our professional educators is required in the career ladder and is a crucial component in our efforts to attract and retain quality teachers. I know from my experiences in the classroom that training, mentoring, and collaboration are essential to growth as professional educators and to our ability to give students the academic rigor and support they need and deserve. Opportunity for every child, regardless of their circumstance, is the goal that IEA members strive to achieve. We, the IEA staff, and our members look forward to working with you as well as well as with all the education stakeholders to move toward the realization of that goal. With that, I thank you and we'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Senator Thane, question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Penny, uh, in 2018, we're going to start uh, the Master Teacher Premium Program. Uh, could you tell me how many which will be for teachers that have been teaching eight years or more. Uh, how many teachers are expecting to get that premium? Ms. Sear. Chairman, uh, Senator Thane. Uh, you know, I think that every teacher who has been working more than eight years ha has an opportunity to earn that master teacher premium. And I know that many of our um, classes have been about the master teacher premium and beginning to build their portfolios. And those classes, every time we offer them, are overflowing. We try to limit them to 50 teachers in each class, and we often let many more in. And we've been doing that almost every weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, yes. Ms. Sear, thank you. Uh, Senator Guthrie, please. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Sear, question on discretionary funding, and I'm a big advocate for uh, discretionary funding and local control as well, so I appreciate your comment on that. But just to give you an example, the $15 million that's proposed to be put in for health insurance to offset those problems that normally would come out are discretionary is an example of things that have happened in the past where things traditionally funded with discretionary have been spun off into a line item do you make an effort to reconcile how that really looks in terms of, uh, you know, the additional light items that's be crea been created that were additionally indiscretionary? Ms. Sear? Chairman, Senator Guthrie, thank you for that question. Um, it is our belief that the more control you give to the local school districts, uh, the better opportunity they have to run their school districts well. So uh, the fewer line items in our education budget, we believe it would be the best thing that you could do. So discretionary funding um, is playing catch up. Uh, we're uh, entering, this is the 2018 budget, and again, we're about nine years behind. 
So instead of making a line item for insurance and a line item for this or that, I think you need to trust your administrators and your school boards and your educators to do what is absolutely best for their students and their community and to figure out how to spend that money. So we believe the money should be in discretionary funds and that's where districts can better spend it for their needs. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Not seeing any further questions. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Thank you very much.